lesson this week is the continuation of the hour of judgment has come. And we want to continue our study on Daniel and the prophecy of the 2300 days. Some people refer to it as the 70 weeks. For those watching via television, we have a free lesson for you this week. It is called, God Sets a Date for the Judgment. And if you call the number on your screen, we'll send this to you absolutely free, along with the DVD of today's program. So we invite you to call that number. Well, let's have prayer as we get started, and we'll jump right into our study. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come together to study your word, especially on this day, Lord, on a Sabbath, the day that you've blessed and set aside and made holy. We ask this morning that you would keep distraction from this place, that you would bring clarity of speech to me, that you would bless my words and uh, give me the wisdom, Lord, to present the prophecy that you wrote, that you uh, gave to Daniel so long ago. We ask for your Holy Spirit and that discernment to be here with us so that we may be drawn closer to Christ, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you may remember last week we started talking about the sanctuary, the earthly sanctuary that was given to Moses, the plans for that tabernacle that he was to build. And we said that it's important to understand this earthly sanctuary because in it is really the way of salvation, isn't it? The Bible tells us that thy way, O Lord, is in the sanctuary. And so we find that many of the words that Christ spoke in his ministry applied to that earthly sanctuary, that lesson plan of salvation. So for example, Jesus said that he is the way and we know that there's only one door into that sanctuary. He also said that I am the door. So a lot of his I am statements applied to the sanctuary. Should have been a bell that went off on the, the heads of those who were listening to Christ as he said, I am, I am, I am, because each one of those statements was really his uh, stating that he was fulfilling something in that sanctuary. He said that I am the light. We know that the candlesticks were in that first compartment there, the holy place of the sanctuary. He also said, I am the bread, and so forth. So we know that in the sanctuary we really find a beautiful explanation, if you will, of the way of salvation that God has for man. Now we also found out that in that sanctuary service there was something called the Day of Atonement. Now how often every year did the Day of Atonement take place? Just once, right? And who was allowed to go into the most holy place on that day? Only the high priest. That's right. And the symbolism here is that the sin of the camp that had, they had been confessing and sacrificing the lamb and that sin was entering into the sanctuary through the mediation of the priest was building up. And at the end of the year, the, sim, the sim, symbol here is that we are going to cleanse the sanctuary. The high priest is going to make one final atonement in this most holy place and rid the whole sanctuary of sin. Now we know that in the earthly sanctuary that continued from year to year, didn't it? But in the heavenly, as we're about to look at, the symbol that the uh, basically we're looking at the fulfillment of this, that will be once and for all. And so it's critical to understand what does this mean for us as God's people and how does it apply to us. Hebrews 8.1 tells us that we have such a high priest, speaking of Christ, who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the where? In the heavens a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. And so again, just to reiterate, the tabernacle or the sanctuary that Moses built on earth was just a pattern, wasn't it? It was just a pattern of the true which existed in heaven. Revelation 14.7 we read and we said this is a pretty serious warning. We need to find out what it means for us. And it says, Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come. We said that's important because it doesn't say that it is coming or that it will come. This verse tells us that it has come. It is present tense, you could say. And so we looked in Revelation and we found that as we look at the symbolism in Revelation, it begins in the first chapter with Jesus standing among the candlesticks. Now what, what uh, section of the sanctuary is where the candlesticks would be? The first, the holy place, right? 
And as we moved through Revelation, we found a couple scriptures where it described Jesus being somewhere else, where the Ark of His Covenant was seen, and we know that that is the most holy place. So we said, well, if that Day of Atonement or Day of Judgment has begun, that means that Jesus, as we move through Revelation, is moving from one part of the sanctuary into the next. Now, on earth, when could that happen? When could the high priest go into the most holy place? Only once a year, right? And that was the Day of Atonement or the Day of Judgment, that cleansing of the sanctuary. So in Revelation, we find a major clue that at some point, this Day of Atonement began in heaven. And we ask the question, when? When? How can we find out when this Day of Atonement began in heaven? And we found that in order to understand Revelation, as always, we need to go to the book of Daniel. Daniel and Revelation, companion books, they work hand in hand to give us the understanding of one another. So we went to Daniel 8 and we read the whole chapter. And we found in that chapter the imagery of the ram and the goat. Everybody remember that? And as we moved through there, we found that this is very similar to chapter 2 and chapter 7. And there was a principle we found there that's called repeat and expand, which basically tells us that Daniel, in his visions, is going over the same information, the same world history, but he's repeating it, and every time he repeats it, he's expanding on it. And so we said when in Daniel 2, the vision of the statue was vague, right? We get a general history, but we don't get any real specific details. But then in chapter 7, that same world history is repeated, but it's expanded upon. And in there, we get many details about each one of these world kingdoms. And we found that Daniel chapter 8 was no different. In the imagery of the ram and the goat, we're getting greater detail into this world history. And so we found the fulfillment of these um, prophetic images explained by the Bible itself. We didn't have to speculate or guess as to what they were. The Bible told us. So Daniel 8.20, it said, The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Medo-Persia. We also found in verse 22 that the rough goat that he saw is the king of Grecia, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. So looking at history, what was the, who was the first king of Greece? Alexander the Great. So the first horn is Alexander the Great. And we know that the, the prophecy went on. It says, now that being broken, that first horn being broken, whereas four stood up for it. Four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation. And we know from history that when Alexander fell, four came up. There was a battle for power, and eventually four generals came to power. Cassandra, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. Now, out of those four, the prophecy continued and said, a little horn will come out from among them. And we did much study looking at all the scriptures that Daniel gave us, comparing them with Revelation, looking at history, and we had a question to answer. Could it be possible that that little horn was Epiphanes, or was it Rome? And what did we find was the only power that it could be based on the Bible? Rome. It had to be Rome. There was too many specifics in that prophecy that it could apply to no one else other than Rome. And we said even in that repeat and expand part of the prophetic understanding that we see a general principle that in those other prophecies the next kingdom to come to power was always Rome. So it would be no different in this one in Daniel chapter 8. And so knowing that specifically we found in Daniel 8.13 Again, this question, how long will this take place? How long shall be the vision concerning the continuance, which we found to be the, the understanding of the daily, the continuance of desolation, and the continuance of transgression? And so, in Rome, we really have two powers, don't we? When it first came to power, it was pagan Rome, and over time, it developed into papal Rome. And so, in this verse we have both represented. How long will this power come against God's people, against God's truth? And so how long will be the vision concerning the continuance of desolation, which would be pagan Rome, the desolating power, and the continuance of transgression, which would be a baptized paganism, where we're transgressing against God's law and His commandments. And so this vision 
this uh, time period that's given to Daniel, this is really the question, isn't it? How long will this persecuting power come against God's people in both forms? In that pagan form and in that papal form? Well, we found the answer to that question, Daniel 8.14. He says, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Then will that power be taken out as far as the truth will no longer be cast to the ground. So where do we start? That was the real question from there. We found out how long is this power going to come against the truth of God. But then where do we start? 2300 days from when? And we found that if we move to Daniel chapter 9, the vision continues. And we found that 70 weeks are cut off from that original 2300 day prophecy. And so 70 weeks are determined or cut off upon thy people and upon thy holy city to seal up the vision and prophecy. So those 70 weeks were cut off for thy people. Who is thy people in this prophecy? Jews. Be the Jewish nation. That's correct. So 70 weeks are determined or cut off. So we found that 70 weeks, and of course we're talking prophetic time, would be 490 days or literal years. Whenever we have a day in prophecy, it is a year. And we found several scriptures that apply that principle. And so looking at the whole thing, we have that 2300 day spread, 2300 years, and then that 490 or 70 weeks that is said to be cut off for the people of God. That would leave us 1810 years left in the full spectrum of that 2300 day prophecy. Everybody with me so far? Okay, this is review, but we need to review this. Okay, so we wanted to know when did this prophecy start? And within that 70 weeks, Gabriel told Daniel that, the, that basically from the going forth of the command to rebuild Jerusalem, that is our starting point. And we found in Ezra 7.7 7, that the decree was given for King Artaxerxes and that decree among the three that were given was the one that actually took action. That's the one where the rebuilding actually started to take place. And we know through history that that decree was 457 B.C., 457 B.C. So now we have a starting point for our 2300-day prophecy. Now, 70 weeks uh, in that prophecy, we were told that 69 weeks until the Messiah. Remember that in the prophecy of the 70 weeks? So we figured 69 weeks, which is seven days a week, that would equal 483 days, or since we're talking prophecy, 483 years until the coming of the Messiah. So, with our starting point of 457 BC, if we move forward 483 years, we come to the year 27 AD. Now, what happened in the year 27 AD? The prophecy said the Messiah would come. Did he come? Yes, he did. We know that that is the date that Jesus was baptized. So again, we're seeing an amazing fulfillment of prophecy. And as I said last week, I've always been amazed that this prophecy has not been used to help people to understand the power of the Bible. Some people say, why should I believe the Bible? You know, you've got all these religions, all these different uh, faiths out there. Why is the Bible the book to believe in? Well, God hasn't asked us to believe in blind faith. And He has given us such powerful prophecies in order for people to put their faith in a God who can declare the end from the beginning. Amen? And so this prophecy to me is, is one of, the, of my favorite as you look at uh, the fulfillments, just one after another, that were given to Daniel. We know that Jesus understood the time that He was working in because He said in the beginning of His, of his ministry, right after He was baptized, the time is fulfilled. Now, what time is he talking about? It has to be that understanding, his understanding of the prophecy given through Daniel that his ministry would begin. So, there's one prophetic week or seven literal years left in the prophecy. Remember, we had 69 weeks unto Messiah. So, we have found the starting point of the Messiah's ministry. So, if there's 69 weeks minus the one, we're at that week currently. So Daniel 9.26 said, And after the 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off. Now remember, Daniel 9.26 and 25 go together to make 69 weeks. Okay? 
So it's kind of hard in the Old English. You've got to put the weeks together. But we're talking after the 69 weeks. Then Messiah shall be cut off. Everybody understand that? So that little word after, if it's after the 69 weeks, what week would we have to be in? The 70th, right? Now it's amazing to me that so many of the modern day prophecy teachers take the 70th week of Daniel 9 and they launch it all the way to the end of the world and they make it out. Have you ever heard of the seven year tribulation? Very popular today. Left Behind teaches it. Many ministries teach it today. This is where it comes from. They're taking the 70th week of Daniel and they're, they're chopping it off of this prophecy and they're just throwing it way out into the future. Now there's no biblical reason to do that. There's, no, uh, there's no, really no governing rule that allows you ever to take a part of a prophecy and just throw it off into the future, especially when you're working under a timeline. So if we're working with 70 weeks, then it's 70 weeks, not 10,000 weeks or however many would be in between the 69th week and the 70th. So right here we're given a major clue. After the 69 weeks, Messiah would be cut off. So that puts us as we've already said, right into the 70th week. Now, does that work out prophetically? Yes, it does. Daniel 9.27 continues, it says, But in the middle of the week, He, being the Messiah, shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And so we said, very simply, what is half of seven? Three and a half. Three and a half years from the fall of 27 A.D. leads us to the spring of 31 A.D., and now the, the scripture said that Messiah would be cut off. Was he cut off in 31 AD? Yes, he was. We know that that is the date that Christ was crucified. And we could say that he was crucified exactly on time. Remember throughout his ministry, many times they would try to capture him to kill him. And he would say, my time has not yet come. My time has not yet come. That's because he knew based on this prophecy when he was to give his life for the world. Now, at that crucifixion, we're told in the scriptures that the veil in that sanctuary was ripped in the temple from top to bottom. And we said that that symbolized the fact that those sacrifices were done away with, that Christ was the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. So they would have no more meaning within that um, system. So, just to review very quickly, the decree was given in 457 B.C., which is our starting point for the for the 70 weeks we're looking at right now. Then we find that 483 years later, 69 weeks later, we come to 27 AD, which is when Jesus began his ministry. Then three and a half years into that, the prophecy told us that Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself. And we know that that was the crucifixion. And he wasn't cut off for himself, was he? Was he guilty of sin? No, he was cut off for you and I. And so now we're looking at this last three and a half years of the prophecy. So Daniel 9.27 tells us, Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Now this is in the context of the Messiah, the 70th week. Now the question here, what becomes very confusing to many, is how can Christ confirm a covenant with many for one week if we just found out that he is cut off in the middle of the week. Everybody follow me? So the question is, how does he confirm a covenant with many for one full week when his ministry is cut off halfway through? Well, we're going to dig in and answer that question because we have this three and a half years left on this 70-week prophecy to deal with. So we need to ask a question. In order to dig and to find the answer to the previous question, we need to ask some other questions. To whom did Jesus tell his disciples to first preach? To the, to the house of Israel. That's right. Matthew 10 tells us, Jesus said to them, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So very specifically, he was telling them not to go to the Gentiles, but to go to his chosen people. What warning did Jesus give to his chosen people? Well, we find through Scripture, this repeated many times, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. So we have two principles here. Number one, Jesus first of all told them not to go to the Gentiles, but to go to his own people. 
then he is saying that at some point the kingdom is going to be taken from the Jewish people and given to another nation that is bearing fruits. Now this is alluded to, and I love this scripture and how it works with this prophecy. Matthew 18, Peter comes to Jesus. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Peter here is asking a very important question. If someone is doing me wrong, how often do I have to forgive him? And what is Jesus' answer? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Now here's a question. What is seventy times seven? 490. Here Jesus is pointing or trying to point their eyes back to this prophecy. 490, 70 weeks are determined for thy people. How long did God forgive the Jewish nation? How long did he give them a grace period? 70 weeks. And that's exactly the principle that Christ is giving to Peter here, trying to sway their eyes back to this prophecy. So, Daniel 9.27, our original question. Then he, the Messiah, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. So he is confirming his everlasting covenant with his people for this final 70th week. How does he do it when he's cut off midway? Here's the answer. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord? and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Did you catch it? First, it began to be spoken by the Lord. Now Hebrews is written by Paul, so he's saying that first it was confirmed to the apostles by the Lord himself, right? The first three and a half years of Jesus' ministry, he confirmed it in person. Then it says, was confirmed to us by those who who heard him. So after Jesus' ministry was cut off, how was it confirmed? By those who heard him, by the eyewitnesses of those who walked and spoke with Jesus in person. So we know that that confirming of the covenant was done for a whole week based on the fact that it was done through Christ for the first three and a half years and then through his apostles for the last three and a half years of that prophecy. So who is the other nation spoken of by Jesus which would become his chosen people? Well, Galatians 3.29 gives us an important principle. It says, and if you be Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So here's an important question. How do I become Abraham's seed? The scripture tells us that if I'm in Christ, then I become Abraham's seed. The chosen people, if you will, transferred from Israel to the church. So we could say that we are spiritual Israel based on that principle. And there are other scriptures. Romans 2, 28 and 29 tells us, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And the New Testament tells us that it's not the circumcision of the flesh, but the circumcision of the heart, right? the inward change that matters. And so the church really becomes the spiritual Israel of the New Testament. So that three and a half years that it was confirmed by Christ, that last three and a half years it was confirmed to the Jewish people by the apostles, and then the prophecy says that they would be cut off. And Jesus alluded to that when he said that, that, that his kingdom would be given to a nation bearing fruits. And that kingdom, of course, would be the church or any believer in Christ. So, we have in that last three and a half years from 31, when Jesus was cut off, to 34. Now, did anything happen scripturally that we can point at to say, yes, at that point, the gospel, if you will, stopped going specifically to the nation of Israel and began to go to the Gentiles? Yes, we look at the stoning of Stephen as that final event. Any time that you see God or I should say specifically Jesus, standing in prophecy or in uh, Scripture, we know that judgment has ended. We're going to look in a little bit at the fact that there's coming a time when Jesus will stand up in the most holy place 
And at that point, we know that it is finished. That he who is filthy will remain filthy, and he who is righteous will remain righteous. When Stephen was stoned and he looked into the heavens, what did he see? Christ. Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father, symbolizing that judgment was over for the nation of Israel that 70 weeks had met its completion when Stephen was stoned. Now what was the fruit of the stoning of Stephen? Who was nearby that held the coats of those who stoned him? Paul was. And what happened to Paul, who was Saul at the time? What happened to Saul? He was converted. His name was changed to Paul. And where did the gospel go from Paul? To the Gentiles. That's right. And so Paul's converted and sent to the Gentiles. And so we have a direct fulfillment of that prophecy. Isn't that wonderful? As we see that 70 weeks just wrap around and just every point of that prophecy comes out. So beautiful how God's Word uh, speaks the end from the beginning. Well, there's some other points in that 70 weeks that I just wanted to touch on briefly. It also mentioned in verse 26, it says, And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, and till the end of the war desolations are determined. So this is looking prophetically past the 70 weeks, really, because it's talking about the, about the prince who is to come. Now we find in John 14.30, Jesus alludes to this. He says, Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Now who is the prince of this world? Satan. And what power was he working through at this point in, in time? Rome. We found that last week, didn't we, as we looked at Revelation 12? Satan is described as the dragon with seven heads, right? And that dragon was standing at the foot of the woman waiting to snatch up her child, who we know is Christ. But that dragon had seven heads. And we said that those seven heads would represent Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece had four heads, and then Rome would be the seventh. So Satan is working through the power of Rome at this time. Just keep that in your minds. It also says in verse 27, And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. And so we know from the previous verse that it is alluding to the prince who would come and would destroy God's city. And then this one says, On the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate. John 2.16 when Jesus began his ministry, you remember that he cleansed the temple, didn't he? Went in and made a whip of cords. And he said, take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Referred to it as his father's house. Now as you compare the Gospels, you'll find that Jesus did the cleansing of the temple a second time. At the end of his ministry. And he also referred to it as his house. My house should be a house of prayer. But... At the end of his ministry in Matthew 23, 38, he said, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Okay? Now why would he say that? Because at the crucifixion, how much of what took place in the temple was significant anymore? Nothing. Jesus was the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. And so all the, the things that they went through that symbolized his work and ministry met its fulfillment in Christ. So in Daniel 9.27, it says, He shall make it desolate even until the consummation. So what came and destroyed this earthly temple that was no longer a part of the plan of salvation? It was desolate even until the consummation? Well, it was the destruction of Jerusalem and specifically the temple in 70 A.D. And who did that? It was Rome. The people of the prince who was to come it was Rome that did that. There was a rebellion among the Jewish leaders. They did not want to give sacrifices for the Jewish rulers anymore. And there was a revolt. And there was a tangling that went back and forth. And eventually, Rome surrounded Jerusalem. Cut off all food supply, all in and out traffic. And for months, starved the people of Jerusalem to the point where history tells us and even scripture prophesied that the women would eat their own children that men would gnaw on the, the leather of their sandals just hoping to get some sort of nutrition out of that leather. So it was one of the worst 
raids, uh, destructions that ever happened throughout history, they say that the blood flowed out of that temple up to the kneecaps because everybody ran into the temple. When, when Rome finally stormed that city, all the Jews ran into the temple for safety and there was such a massive slaughter that the blood ran out up to the kneecaps. And then we know that they uh, started a fire and that the temple was destroyed at that point. So again, a flood, it is symbolized in that prophecy of Daniel, is symbolized as a flood uh, of consummation. So let's look again at this 2300 and review very quickly. We have the starting point of 457, which is a starting point for both the 2300 days, the big prophecy, and also that 490, that 70 week period. And so, 457 is our starting point, the 70 weeks, we have the decree, and then we have 69 weeks up to Messiah, 27 AD. Then we have that final week, that seven years that remains. We found that from 27 to 31 was three and a half years. At 31, we have his ministry starting at 27, his crucifixion at 31, and then that final three and a half years takes us to 34, which is when the gospel went from the Jewish nation then to the Gentiles. That leaves us with 1,810 years left in this whole 2300 day prophecy which brings us to the year 1844. According to the angel who spoke with Daniel, what would happen at the end of the 2300 years? Anyone remember what would happen? Cleansing of the sanctuary. Daniel 8.14, And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Remember that cleansing of the sanctuary is referred to as the Day of Atonement or the Day of Judgment. And so here we are at 1844, the cleansing of the sanctuary or judgment begins. So now the big question. What happened in 1844 on earth to fulfill this prophecy? Nothing. Nothing happened. That's, that's what makes this prophecy so irritating to so many people is because they want to look to some earthly fulfillment of 1844. And there is none. The reason for that is because it's not what happened on earth in 1844 that's important. It's what happened in heaven, isn't it? We know that in 1844, based on this prophecy, that Jesus went from that first compartment into the second. Now, what does that mean for us as Christians? That's what we're going to focus on for the last half of this message today. But there is something that did happen, and I heard it, Henry, you said it. There is something that did happen on earth that is significant, though. It was called the Great Disappointment, which followed the Great Awakening. And see, there were men who began to understand the prophecy of Daniel. They began to see very clearly as they ran the numbers forward and backwards and forward again, that there was nothing else that could come to the end of this prophecy except for the year 1844. They believed in it so fully that they began to sell their things because this is the mid-1800s. This is right at the start of the 1800s. And they believed that the cleansing of the sanctuary was the earth. They believed that that cleansing would be the cleansing of fire that is spoken of at the second coming of Christ. So they believed in 1844 that Jesus was going to come back again. And they believed so fully in that prophecy that many of them sold their items, their homes and everything. And they put everything behind this message that Jesus was coming again. Now we know as we look back that they were wrong about what the cleansing of the sanctuary was. But that does not take anything away from the fact that something very significant did happen in 1844. We know that Jesus began this day of atonement in the heavens, in the real sanctuary. Now, some would say, could God be behind anything that was such a disappointment? Well, friends, you will find behind every disappointment of God, He is creating a movement. Think about it. The Jewish nation is brought out of Egypt. What is the first thing that they experience once they cross the Red Sea? A great disappointment. They are thirsty and they come to water, and what is it? It's bitter, right? And so God is creating through that movement of people a movement that was supposed to go into the promised land. Now they had a lot of things to work through in their characters in order to get there, but it started with a great disappointment. What about the disciples who followed Christ? 
What did they think that his earthly ministry was going to lead to? Destruction of Rome, right? They thought if this, that he was the Messiah, that he was going to take Rome out of leadership and that the Jewish nation would again rise on top and all those Old Testament prophecies that they had twisted a little bit would come true. Did they experience a great disappointment? You better believe it. At the crucifixion of Christ, there could be no greater disappointment. Many of them, their, their whole, all the wind that was within their sails was taken away, wasn't it? I mean, everything that they had put their life into for the last three and a half years was just, it was like the, the rug was pulled right out from under them. But yet through that experience, did God build a movement? Yes, the New Testament church was born out of that great disappointment. And so in the same way, out of 1844, even though it was a great disappointment, there was a movement of people that were started that had a message to send to the world. What is happening in this pre-Advent judgment in heaven? What do we understand for Christians? What is the point of, of this prophecy? What does it mean for us? Well, you'll find that it's much like what we find in judgment here on earth. We have three things. We have an investigation of evidence we have a decision or a verdict, and then we have a punishment or reward, right? And so many times the judge will dis disappear into a back room where he will look over the evidence that has been presented. Then he will make a decision as he's in that back room. He will contemplate the evidence and make a decision based on that evidence. And then he will come out of the back room and he will administer a punishment or a reward, right? So we find the same thing in this pre-advent judgment, this investigative judgment that's happening in heaven. Revelation 22:11, speaking of the time when this will close, when Jesus will stand out of the most holy place, it says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and he which is filthy, let him be filthy still, and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. How many groups of people do you have here? Really two. You have the holy and the righteous and the unjust or the filthy. And so the saved and the lost, if you will, are decided before Jesus comes again. Two times in Scripture, Jesus says, it is finished. Once he said it from the cross. When his work as the Lamb of God ceased, he said, it is finished. Now once the blood was spilled, it had to be applied in you and I's behalf. And so the work of the Messiah was not finished. We know that the blood had to be taken in the earthly sanctuary by who? Priest. The priest. A priest had to minister the blood or it was of no value. Many Christian denominations today kill Jesus at the cross, but they deny him the priesthood that would allow him to intercess for their sin. And so we need to be very careful that we understand that the work of salvation was not finished at the cross. It had just begun. Jesus died and that His work as the Lamb of God was finished, but yet He had a work to do in our behalf as our high priest, didn't He? And so the second time that He says it is finished in Scripture is found in Revelation and it is at the close of His priestly ministry in that most holy place. Then, Revelation 22:12, the very next verse says, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. And so, Jesus is saying that his reward is with him. Now, now the question is, how could his reward be with him if he hasn't investigated the evidence? And the truth is that if he has, that's the point of the Scripture. It's telling us that there is a judgment that happens in heaven before Jesus comes again. His reward is already with him to give to how many men? Every man, all men, right? Mark 13, 37. So often Jesus would say in his parables and in his teachings, and what I say to you, I say to all, watch, be ready, right? Why would Jesus give us a command or warn us to be ready to watch if it wasn't important? The truth is that as we understand this Day of Atonement better, we begin to understand that what Jesus is calling us to do is to make preparation for the coming of Christ. To make a preparation for the uh, coming of our Savior. We are to be ready so that it does not take us unawares. 
Jeremiah 8.20 talks about the other group of people who are not ready. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. A group of people who may have called the name of the Lord, but were not preparing to meet Him. Whose cases are being considered in this pre-Advent judgment? 1 Peter 4.17 tells us something very important. It tells us that the judgment must begin at the house of God. Who is the house of God? It's the church, right? It's the church of Christ. And so, as we look at the sanctuary, we find a very important principle. The ministry of Christ that happened in the courtyard, His death in our behalf, right? And this is part of the gospel. We must come to Him, repent of our sin, and accept His sacrifice in our behalf. Is that the end of the gospel? No. It can't be, because as we've discussed, if Jesus spills the blood, but yet doesn't apply it, it's not really worth anything. Actually, in the earthly sanctuary, the priest would even dump some of the blood at the base of that altar, representing the many who would not access the blood of Christ because of their own pride, and it would be wasted. And so, yes, this is a very important part of the gospel, but it continues as Jesus calls us into the holy place where He ministers the blood in our behalf. Now, in here, we are partaking of the showbread, which is the word of life. We are praying to Christ, and these prayers are represented in the sanctuary as the incense that would waft over this veil into the very presence of God. And then there was the light that we are to share with our neighbors and friends of what God has done for us. All three of those things vital for salvation. So, this is a part of the gospel. Is that everything? No. It's vitally important. Both of these things are vitally important and without them, you will not make it into the kingdom of God. But is it finished there? Is that the whole gospel? No. There is a cleansing that Christ wants to do in your heart. Remember that Jesus cleansed the sanctuary on earth, didn't He? He went with a whip of cords and He basically tried to get all the things that were in the temple out that didn't belong there. Well, the New Testament tells us that our bodies are the temple of God, doesn't it? And Jesus wants to do a work within us that is a cleansing of our sanctuary, just as He's doing in the heavenly sanctuary right now. And so this part, I like to think of it as overcoming. Because in the cleansing, in the putting out of sin that is in our hearts and in our life, we are overcoming through the power of Christ. So, without these three elements, or these three sections of the sanctuary, the gospel is really not complete. In the earthly sanctuary, as it speaks of this day of atonement, which we now know that we're in, it says that you, the people, shall afflict their souls. Now basically what that means is to take very seriously any known sin that is in their lives. It's a heart searching. It's a time where the people are to put away anything that would be of any separation between them and God. And there was washing that they had to do and, a, and an outward cleansing. But really the work that God wanted to symbolize was the inward cleansing that needed to happen for this day of atonement, this day of judgment. Why is it so important? Because if there was known sin that was practiced and cherished at that time of the earthly sanctuary proceedings, we found out last week what would happen to that person if their sin hadn't gotten into the sanctuary. They're put out of the camp, cut off from the people. And so we find very clearly that these people, during this Day of Atonement, have to be afflicting themselves, pre preparation, if you will, for this work that is being done in the Most Holy. Is this biblical as far as understanding that Christ is going to perfect His people? Yes, we have many, many examples. I just listed a few here. 1 John 3 tells us that we do not know what we shall be. In other, in other words, we don't understand it now. But when He comes, we shall be like Him. Now that doesn't mean physically. We're not going to have scars in our hands and that kind of thing. It means spiritually. It means uh, your character will be like Him. You will reflect Christ. It's the only way that we will be able to look upon Him in His holiness is if we reflect Him in character. Otherwise, we would be destroyed by His brightness.
The book of Jude tells us very specifically that God, Christ, is able to keep you from stumbling, from falling. He is able. And Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6 tells us that He will complete the good work that He started in us. What does the complete work of God look like? Is it all falling apart and not finished? When God finished the work of creating the earth, was it finished? Yes. When God does something, He said it was good, good, and very good as He worked through that creation process. If He's going to complete the good work that He started in you, will it be perfect? Yes. Yes. 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Paul tells us, Having therefore these promises, ones like we just read, Dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now what was the incredible warning that we were given in Revelation chapter 14? Fear God. Give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come. You see the parallels here? This is a cleansing that needs to be taking place within God's people now. Matthew 7.21 is a fearful verse. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Well, on that day, Jesus says, Many will come to me, and they'll say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this and didn't we do that? Weren't we in that first compartment of the sanctuary where the bread and the light and the prayers were? Didn't we pray and didn't we... And Jesus says, depart from me. I never knew you. Why? And then he goes on to say, you who practice iniquity. You who practice iniquity. These are people who are trying to be in a relationship with Christ, but yet cherish sin at the same time. You see what I'm saying? And so they are trying to live two lives. And Jesus says at his second coming, depart from me. I never knew you because you're practicing iniquity. You're continuing something that is killing our relationship. And so you can kid yourself that you're moving through the sanctuary in those steps, but if you're not in the most holy place where there is a cleansing taking place and overcoming through the power of Christ, a putting away of sin and an afflicting of your soul, a seriousness about the fact that God is holy and He calls us to be holy then we're missing the boat. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5, um, that first three words, He who overcomes. It's the message that is given to every one of the seven churches in the beginning of Revelation. He who overcomes. Must overcome. Through the power of Christ, we must overcome. Otherwise, we're missing it. What does he say? He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments... And I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. That's judgment language. That is a work of a cleansing that's happening there. Do you see it? He is confessing his name before my Father and before his angels. There is a mediator kind of work that's happening there, a sanctuary language. He who overcomes. Let's look together at Hebrews chapter 9. And we're going to read verses 24 through 28. Hebrews chapter 9 and verses 24 through 28. Hebrews chapter 9, 24 through 28. This is packed. Good scripture to memorize. Hebrews chapter 9, 24, we will begin. The Bible says, For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the end of the ages... He has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for Him, He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Now this is loaded. It tells us three things. Number one, once in the end of the world, he will put away sin. Did you catch that in the scripture? 
So there will be a finale of sin. The book of Nahum tells us it will not rise a second time. The second point is that after this judgment is when it happens. It is appointed once for men to die and after this the judgment. He is going to put away the sin of the world and after this judgment, number three, he will appear the second time without sin unto salvation. He is no longer ministering for sin when he comes again, apart from sin for salvation. And there will be a group of people on the world who will take seriously the words of Christ when he said, watch therefore and pray because you do not know what hour the Son of Man comes. And so very important, he is going to appear what time? The second time. Now there are many who teach that there's this secret coming and the snatching away of the church and then there's this seven year trib which we just saw was not biblical. That would be the second coming. But this verse tells us very specific that the second time Jesus comes, it is apart from sin. The work of mediation for us is over. And so he who is holy will be holy, and he who is filthy will be filthy. Only two groups when Jesus comes back again. And that's why throughout Scripture you have Jesus coming, and you have the sheep and the goats separated into two groups. The wheat and the tares separated into two groups. Because it's already known who is on God's side and who is not. What will be examined in this first phase of judgment? Ecclesiastes tells us that God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. Jesus is called the faithful witness. There is nothing that passes his attention. He knows even our motives within our hearts. James 2.12, they, being God's people, shall be judged by the law of liberty. We know that that law of liberty is the Ten Commandments, the definition of sin. Is God my accuser in the judgment? Is God trying to keep you out of heaven? Looking for a technicality so that he can brush you to the side? Of course not. Jesus died so that we could be in heaven with him. That old serpent called the devil was cast out into the earth. The accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Must I stand alone in the pre-advent judgment? No. We have Jesus as our mediator. 1 John 2.1 tells us he is our advocate. John 5.22 tells us He is our judge. And Revelation 3.14 tells us that He is our faithful and true witness. With Christ on our side, who could be against us? Who could be victorious who was against us? How can I be assured that I will make it through this judgment? It seems so specific. He's going to bring every work into judgment. We have to be perfect. How is all this going to happen? Only through the power of Christ. As we grab onto him, as Jacob did it old and said, I will not let go until you bless me. Trust me, friends, God wants nothing more than to give you victory. He wants nothing more than to perfect your character. He wants nothing more to present you faultless before the Father. That's what he wants for you, is to save you and I. 1 John 2, 1, John says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you what? so that you will not sin. That's the whole point. I, I'm, the Bible, the Scripture, the Word of God is written to you so that you will not sin. But, don't fear. If anybody does sin, we fall. We struggle. If anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our, defen in our defense, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus stands ready, waiting, to intercede for you and I. He wants nothing more than for you and I to be in heaven. He's not trying to keep us out. He is trying to perfect a people that will be safe to take into the kingdom of God, who will not cherish sin more than their Savior. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. The averse of that is that if he does not overcome, then He will blot out His name from the book of life. But friends, we want to be overcomers, don't we? In Christ, we want to overcome the world because He has overcome it for us. With His power, all things are possible. So looking one more time at this prophecy, we found it began in 457. It stretched through the 70 weeks where we were given very definite reasons to believe that this prophecy is true. We see very surely that in 27 A.D., Jesus came right on time.
We saw for absolute that in 31 AD he was crucified as the prophecy told us that he would be cut off, but not for himself. And in 34 AD we see the fact that the gospel went not just to the Jewish nation anymore, but to the whole world, to the Gentiles. Three reasons why this prophecy of 1844 is sure and it's true. And why is the world still spinning over a hundred and some years later? Many ask, what is the significance of 1844? It was so long ago. Friends, God's mercy is long-suffering. The book of Peter tells us that he is not willing that any should perish. He wants all to understand the work that is happening in the sanctuary for you and I. So with that in mind, if Jesus is your attorney in the judgment, he promises to win your case. Will you turn your life over to him today? I pray that your answer is yes. And for the friends who are watching at home on their television, I ask that you would call the number on your screen and we will send you a free copy of this DVD and we have the study guide that will lead you through this prophecy. God sets a date for the judgment. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the power of prophecy, for the reassurance that you're a God who can state the end from the beginning and that you're in control. Lord, many of us, even myself, as we look at perfect characters, we shudder to think that we could be such. But your word has promised that you can complete that good work that you started in us. Father, this day we ask that you would do that. Help us, Lord, to surrender everything, that we would not cherish sin, that nothing would separate us from your love and your perfecting holiness, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.